So once again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to all of you. And uh, welcome to the Earthform Foundation webinar on understanding the coconut supply chain. I'm Mathilde Xicola, a member manager at Earthform based in Lyon, Switzerland, and I'm happy to be the moderator of this session today. So we are joined by some amazing speakers, but um, before introducing them, I would like to give you words about who is Earthform and about why are we doing this webinar now. So Earthform Foundation is a global nonprofit organization founded in 1999. And we have spent the last 20 plus years working with our members to support them driving change in their supply chain. With most of our staff located on the ground where the issues are. Our aim is to drive economic, environmental and social impact in their supply chain, ensuring that the commodities in their products do not harm the environment or the people living and working there. So now the big question, why are we organizing this coconut webinar now? As you know, the demand for coconut is growing. Last year, the global industry was worth $13 billion. And by 2024, Allied Market Research estimates that it can rise up to $31 billion. The explanation for this uh, increase in the demand is due to the, the fruit popularity among the health conscious consumers, boosted by the consumer good companies marketing coconut as a healthy option. In addition, there is this global perception that coconut oil is a more sustainable vegetable oil than palm, for example. Although the details of this comparison is neither clear nor concrete. So overall, the coconut product as a commodity has flown under the radar in terms of its sustainability and responsible sourcing aspects of its production. Despite the global knowledge that the vast majority of coconuts is coming from independent smallholders. The percentage varies from 70 to 95% depending on the regions. And we know that those independent smallholders receive a very low price for their harvest in an informally managed sector. That's one of the reasons why we are working on coconuts. Given this introduction, I would like to move on the list of our speakers that we have today, starting with Leonie Brulman, Managing Director at the Lean Cocoa Foundation. Leonie today will talk about the sustainable coconut projects that Lind has in the Solomon Islands, followed by Julia Ardini, the reality colleague at Earthform, who will talk about how Earthform is supporting Lind in the Solomon Islands and about what is the impact that has been generated so far throughout this project. Then we will move continent going to Ivory Coast and welcoming Jérôme Tokpa, our head of West Africa, who will talk about the challenges of the coconut production in this country followed by Ralph Ehrman from Profair Trade, who will describe how Profair Trade and Earthform are working together in Ivory Coast to improve the outcomes for the coconut farmer there. This presentation will be followed by a Q&A session of about 20 minutes, where you will have the opportunity to ask your questions to the speakers. So please feel free to post your question throughout the session in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And if the question is specific to one person, you can use the add function and write the name of the person right after. Finally, as you are not a speaker, please um, switch off uh, your camera and uh, put your microphone on mute. Um, I would like also to mention that this session is uh, recorded, so all the participants will receive the recording after the call. Without further ado, I would like to um, 
introduce uh, Leonie Ruhlman and Julia Ardini who will talk about the coconut production, its challenges and the initiative there. So Leonie, I leave you the floor. Thanks a lot, Mathilde, for that nice introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Leonie. I'm the managing director of the Lind Coco Foundation. I have kind of a double role. So at the same time, I'm, a, I'm the head of sustainability of Lind and Sprüngli. Next slide, please. The Lind Coco Foundation was founded in 2013. Um, its vision is that the cultivation, production and processing of raw materials, which are used in chocolate, uh, so of course cocoa, but also other raw materials um, like coconut oil or hazelnuts, have a positive effect on sustainable agricultural development in the origin countries. Um, the foundation focuses a lot on cocoa, um, but not only. Um, in our mission, we define that we foster sustainable agriculture in developing and emerging regions through the support of innovative projects. Um, and we really want to enable the farmers. And once a solution seems to be scalable, um, often these projects are then handed over to Linton Sprüngli, who um, do the scale up. Next slide, please. So um, a, big, a bit of a context, um, Lintage Springly actually um, doesn't have any sustainability targets for coconut oil in place yet. Coconut oil is used in some um, chocolate fillings or praline fillings of Lintage Springly. Um, however, we did a raw material risk assessment and um, that showed, of course, that coconut oil brings various sustainability challenges and issues with it and will in future be one of the raw materials that we will tackle more strategically um, as well with regards to sustainability. However, in 2017, we were still in a very explorative phase. We kicked off a sustainable coconut oil program um, as a collaboration between the Lind Coco Foundation together with Earth Foundation, who uh, brings in all the expertise to build up that program, um, but also together with Pacific Rim, respectively SICPL, which is a local crude oil exporter in the Solomons, and with Florine, a Swiss um, oil supplier of Linton Springley, Switzerland. For us, uh, the Lind Coco Foundation, this project was the first project we launched around sustainable coconut oil. We didn't have a lot of knowledge around the issues um, in the Solomon Islands and also around potential solutions. So for us, it was really um, the idea to launch an innovative project that um, shows us um, what we can learn about coconut oil sustainability. The project's aim um, was defined as followed. We want to build the livelihood and resilience of coconut producing families and communities towards a sustainable supply chain for coconut oil. I will come in more detail to the um, more concrete goals of the project on a later slide. Next slide, please. First, a bit about the context of the Solomon Islands. I'm not sure if you know where these islands are located. Um, actually, east of Papua New Guinea, uh, so in between Papua New Guinea and Vanuatu um, in the Pacific. It's um, a country that consists of six major islands and in total over 900 smaller islands. And it has a population of less than 1 million uh, inhabitants. For the Solomon Island inhabitants, the coconut tree is really the tree of life. Most uh, people use it to consume, um, but they also produce um, coconut products out of the shell and of the coconut itself, of course. Coconut is the largest um, agricultural crop of the Solomon Islands, and uh, it's estimated that around 40,000 households um, earn some income out of coconut. 
Um, very specific to the Solomon Islands is that basically the majority of produced coconuts are um, produced by smallholders and not on large scale plantations. So if you have a look at these islands all around the coast, basically we have small um, areas of coconut oil um, plantations. They have a small size really ranging from um, very uh, few hectares to a couple of hectares. Next slide, please. Just very simplified how the copra uh, supply chain in the Solomon Islands look like. Um, of course, coconuts are, are harvested often in the Solomon Islands. Actually, they just pick them up once they fell down, so they don't climb the trees. Uh, often also that happens on other islands than where the farmers actually live. So then they paddle to their main island where they live and do the dehusking and opening of coconuts. Um, once the coconuts are opened, um, they do a day or two of pre-drying in either the sun on, or over the fire. Uh, once that's done, they remove the, the coconut flesh, the, um, the inside of the coconut from the shell. And then they do a second day of drying. Usually in the Solomon Islands, that's done above um, the heat of fire, as you can see on the lower picture here. So they use old oil barrels to fire in there and use the heat produced by the fire to do um, the drying. And once that's done, it's packed into bags and transported to the buying station, in our case, the buying station of SICPL. So they often paddle several hours to get there or they rent a, a small motorboat to get there. Uh, in our case, then the crude oil is produced still in the Solomon Islands. So they have a, a local oil um, pressing facility there, and then it's exported and shipped to Switzerland um, where the, the oil is refined. Next slide, please. So uh, the key challenges now specifically to the Solomon Islands are that they had um, a political and social crisis end of the 90s, beginning of 20s, which really led um, to an economic crisis of the country. It's still, uh, according to the United Nations, one of the least developed countries in the world uh, with extreme poverty. And um, uh, many families really rely on the income from co copra to finance their basic needs. At the same time, we see very little investments into the cocoa, uh, copra um, coconut farms, sorry, um, and many overaged farms as well. In general, the copra quality in the Solomon Islands is not very high, and we also see low productivity of the farms. A challenge for the farmers is as well the transport. I mentioned it before, many small islands, um, they don't have a lot of motor boats, um, so that's for sure a major challenge um, for the farmers. They also face the rising sea levels due to climate change and um, storms. Uh, often in spring, they have heavy cyclones going over the islands. And we also see a lack of capacity, so lack of knowledge how they can improve uh, the coconut production. Other social issues which came out uh, in the um, needs assessment that Earthform Foundation conducted were the poor sanitation uh, system, but also um, the Solomon Islands is a country with um, very high domestic and sexual violence, uh, other issues like no electricity, access to finance, um, or limited education possibilities. Next slide, please. Um, this is my last slide outlining what the program objectives are. Um, we really try to put the farming families at the forefront and define these four key objectives based the needs assessment. Uh, one objective is that we um, worked with satellite mapping um, to find out where actually do we have coconut uh, plantations and then uh, village-based mappings were, were done. Um, this should help to do transportation strategies together with these villages um, to improve the efficiency and reduce their costs. The second objectives 
uh, objective is reinforced resilience uh, of these farming households and communities, mainly through trainings, but also through uh, community investments. You see here in the picture um, an example of a training where farmers learn how to do intercropping to increase their household income, but also to strength, strengthen the nutrition of the families. The third of objective is that farmers have better access to tools and to farming equipment. The example here is um, that we investigate solar dryers as an alternative to the fire drying as A, it's um, environmentally friendlier, um, reduces the risk of deforestation, but also can be less time consuming and more cost efficient for farmers. And the last uh, objective, we want to have inspired farmers um, who love uh, producing coconut oil. It's deeply inherited in the culture of the Solomon Island people, um, but of course that can still be fostered further. Now I would like to hand over to Julia, who will explain a bit in more detail what we have done to achieve these targets and what the impact has been so far. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leonie. Uh, thank you, uh, Matteo, for the introductions. Um, a pleasant afternoon or evening for, to all of you. Um, just also to would like to introduce myself. I'm Yulia. Uh, I'm leading rurality program at, at One Foundation. So for those who are not really familiar about rurality, so the rurality program is something that we develop uh, the initiative that we developed actually to focus on doing transformations uh, at the smallholder level. Next slide, please. So before I go deeper on some of the key activities, um, uh, I would like to mention that since mid 2018, uh, our one foundations uh, have implemented a transformation action plan in the Solomon Islands. Uh, together with a coconut oil producer, um, uh, namely SICPL. And together with them, we have put in place a work team consists of a local base, experienced professional with various skill sets of social engagement, community development, agriculture, uh, as well as coconut oil production. The focus of our activities uh, in the beginning was actually only in the Western province. And since early uh, 2020, We've been expanding the program into uh, three key sourcing regions, uh, i.e. Guadalcanal, Malaita, and Central Province. So what are the key activities that we are doing in, in all of those provinces? So there are at least eight uh, complementary activities. So uh, we started and, and have been collecting until now over 2,000 farmers uh, data and we create a traceability code so we've been able to trace back the uh, copra uh, into uh, the farm level we also map the coconut plantations um, as indicated earlier by leonie to estimate potential uh, volume for each clusters or villages and islands so this information actually will help us to develop transport transport strategy uh, for example, you know, during a week, uh, SICPL in this case will set up a trucks to receive copra in a nearby market so that farmers can shorten their trips to the warehouse and thus save uh, some fuels and, and, and money. And uh, SICPL also trying to encourage a bigger ship or, or um, you know, small boats that usually bring other goods uh, or fish to also collect copra from uh, farther islands. So, uh, for example, during cyclone, um, and these farmers can keep selling, uh, selling copra. We develop uh, at least 12 training modules uh, until now uh, from best management practices on coconut cultivation, um, uh, copra processing, health and safety, uh, financial literacy, uh, business management was, uh, etc. And we conduct a series of trainings to individual farmers uh, and their families at the village level, as well as at the uh, SICPL warehouses. And we've been also promoting, you know, copra production in, in, in the regions uh, by, you know, um, uh, conducting or, or, or participating in a specific events like a coconut days. 
Uh, in terms of innovation and tools, uh, we also try to assemble uh, locally new tools um, or, or even providing materials that can support farmers to produce copra uh, in a more uh, cost efficient, uh, safer, and, and, and to produce a better quality of copra. And, 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 and that uh, tools varies from the husking tools, uh, providing copra sacks, drum, etc., etc. And started this year, we have developed two solar dryers in two villages as a pilot innovations to improve copra quality and, 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 and to produce a more eco-friendly uh, copra productions. Uh, we also uh, trying to improve um, a resiliency of the uh, farming communities uh, by conducted workshops in different islands. So our team in this case involving in the process of uh, developing water farms, uh, intercropping coconut with food crops, and teach the farmers on how to, um, you know, uh, implementing regenerative or organic farming practices uh, using local materials. We also encourage uh, the farmers to, uh, in this case, a woman to become entrepreneurs uh, or copra buyers. We involving them on uh, also on, on 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 the model farm activities so that they can contribute to the household economy and also trying to create a woman setting club uh, because uh, many of these uh, farmers families, they don't really uh, have an access to, to, to finance um, or banks. And we also selecting some farmers to become the leads in their communities. Uh, this actually will help us further to maintain the knowledge and solutions for their farming communities in the future. And uh, last but not least, we are engaging and collaborating with stakeholders as we realize that we don't have all the knowledge and capacity to address many challenges that mentioned before by learning. So for this, we have engaged in meetings with various stakeholders and try to build collaboration with some of, the, uh, some of them. Next slide, please. For all those activities, we try to monitor the progress. We record output and outcomes uh, for basically to con for continuous improvement. And the impact we have achieved so far, as you can see here, has been addressing at least you know five of the sustainable development goals. Uh, we have benefited over uh, you know 2,300 farmers um, and, and involving 9,000 family members uh, participated in the training programs. We also been able to trace uh, all the farmers uh, supplying copra to, to SSCPL uh, factory. We, in terms of livelihood, we have improved uh, copra moisture content, uh, you know, um, improving about 3.4%. And actually about, uh, you know, over 2000 metric ton copra, copra have been produced by the farmers. And this is, uh, you know, equivalent to, you know, at least uh, creating economic values uh, of about 800,000 US dollars. And this number actually has been increasing since uh, the first inceptions in 2018. Uh, through the model farm and intercropping system, we've been able encouraging 100, more than 100 families to adopt the model farm and intercropping system. And, and in this case, mostly, mostly involving a woman, yeah? And, and, and it also uh, have been successfully uh, provide an additional income uh, for the family, but also providing for self-sufficiency. Uh, we uh, have engaged uh, many stakeholders, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, five organizations, um, you know, have involved and, and collaborated in the program. Next slide, please. So this is how the project partners uh, already mentioned uh, earlier by Leonie. Uh, in terms of the collaboration with the stakeholders, uh, thanks to the government of Solomon Island for providing us uh, the support, especially on, on, on uh, recently, uh, they provide subsidy uh, for the farmers during COVID and also guidance for us uh, related to the pest and disease management. Uh, Rook Tool for Charity uh, also have been you know, kindly uh, providing health facilities and first aid kits for uh, one of our uh, communities in the Western province, uh, Baniata communities. Uh, Days for Girls recently, um, you know, uh, they provided trainings uh, to our team to increase the awareness and uh, of the importance of uh, women reproduction health and hygiene. 
uh, salt tuna. Um, they also provide the, our farmers with access yeah, to sell uh, their vegetable that they produce in the model farm. And uh, last but not least, uh, recently Red, Red Cross uh, Solomon Islands um, also has agreed to support us in providing you know, uh, training for first aid and emergency response. Um, and we realized that uh, while the demand of coconut oil will increase in the future, uh, we still face some, you know, persistent challenges that we, we, we have seen that it cannot be tackled in a, in a short term period of time. But for this, um, you know, uh, we believe that the, by strengthening and continuing our collaborations with the stakeholder, either locally or even regionally, we can achieve more uh, sustain and a greater, uh, greater impact. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is my last slide. Uh, I give this back to Matteo. Thank you very much, um, Leonie and Julia, for uh, giving us uh, insight about the reality of the coconut production in the Solomon Islands and about the activities uh, ongoing there and the impact generated. It's uh, very inspiring. Um, before moving to our two next speakers, I would like just to remind all the participants that uh, there is this possibility to uh, post uh, any of your questions on the Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your screen, so feel free to do so. And now I would like to um, leave the floor to Jérôme and to Ralph, who will uh, um, bring us to Ivory Coast and uh, to the reality of the coconut uh, production there, the challenges, and the initiative ongoing. Uh, Jérôme, I hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mathilde. Um, I'm Jérôme Topa, country head of, uh, of Ivory Coast. And um, yeah, I will be speaking uh, about the challenges on coconut uh, production here in Ivory Coast. And after me, uh, Ralph, uh, who is working for Profet Trade, uh, we'll, we'll take over to, to complete uh, our work here in Ivory Coast. Next slide, please. So Ivory Coast is actually a small, small country in terms of cocoa, coconut production, uh, which is about 2.0.2% of the world cocoa uh, nut production. However, uh, from some Swiss importers, uh, we heard that um, the, the quality of the cocoa the copra oil uh, coming from Côte d'Ivoire is among the best in the world. Next slide. So um, in Africa, Ivory Coast is among the, the let's say, the big five um, after Tanzania, which is the biggest coconut, coco, coconut a copra oil producer, uh, and then Mozambique, and then Nigeria and, and, and Ghana. You can see that the production between 2016 and 2018 is more or less regular. Uh, we have here like about, I think, 142,000 uh, uh, ton uh, production uh, per year, more or less. Next slide. So when you look at the, the, the global production up the, the world production of coconut related to the area that's, that are used uh, you, and, and down the, the, the same, uh, but regarding Ivory Coast Cote d'Ivoire, you can see that between 2001 and 2004, uh, even the, the productivity of the coconut, the coconut in Ivory Coast was, was much higher than, than the world's one. Uh, however, going from 2018, uh, 2008 uh, upwards, you can see that the, the, the area that are used to produce uh, the cocoa, uh, coconut, uh, you know, dec or increase uh, compared to the production. It means the productivity come down drastically, uh, which can be explained uh, by I think three, three uh, key reasons. Next slide. So one of the reasons is, of course, the, the, the low uh, productivity uh, for your information in, in the uh, 60s. The first president of Ivory Coast, 
uh, try to plant coconut and dairy plantation surrounded by smallholder plantation along the coast or the coast of Ivory Coast. And, uh, and um, then in, this, in the 90s, um, we came to the privatization of the, the, the industrial plantation. And, and from there, the smallholder were more or less abandoned. So um, you, you can see really that, yeah, uh, from, from 90s, the, the productivity came down because they were, they were not really followed anymore. Uh, that is one thing. The second thing is, of course, the organization. Uh, due to the fact that they were not uh, followed anymore, the organization of the, the palm, the cocoa uh, palm sector was really, uh, uh, let's say, disaggregated. Yeah. And the, 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 the next challenge is, is the, 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 the stress, the biotech stress. We have here in Ivory Coast like about 400 hectares of coconut. Uh, coconut plantation, cocoa palm plantation that have been uh, destroyed by, by the little yellowing disease. I don't know if you know this disease, but uh, all the leaves of the coconuts are just dried and, and the cocoa, cocoa palm cannot produce anymore. Next slide, please. So when we started our work with, with Profetrade, Profetrade is the Swiss um, based organization. They are located, I, I think the headquarters is in, in Zurich. We started with them, uh, I think in 2014. And, and one of the key challenge for us, because we produce together what we call the responsible sourcing uh, um, policy. And um, for, for profit rate, one of the key, uh, the key action to be taken were full traceability, where uh, child labor free, was also you know, deforestation free and also see ways how we can increase the resilience of the coconut uh, producers in, in Ivory Coast. So you can see that the, we, we, the area we covered during the diagnostic uh, could, I think we can say more or less 400 kilometers stretching from the eastern coast of Ivory Coast to the center west of Ivory Coast. Next slide. And, and when we, we, we did this deep investigation, we, we look really into the plantation. What are the challenges in the, uh, in the plantation? What are the challenges uh, regarding the, co the collection of coconuts? What are the challenges regarding the way of drying? Because you can dry at the sun, you can also dry uh, with, with uh, fire. And, and we, we could see that uh, drying with fire, you know, you have a lot of smoke and things like that on the copra and the way of transporting also challenging and, and you know the the, the, the safety uh, issues also in the in the CNO, uh, CN, CCNO mail. Next slide. So we came we came to to some of the key challenges uh, we, we build a kind of a roadmap roadmap and um, in this roadmap one of the or some of the key challenges, action to be taken were, for example, okay, we started mapping all the, the smallholder plantation, uh, ensuring that we are not in protected area, ensuring also that we are not, you know, in forested area, uh, for your information, but I talked about that in the previous slide, all the, the plantation are actually very old, uh, planted in 1965, so uh, we, we Really saw that we were we were not we were not in, in, in forest area we, we we were not deforesting any any uh, density forest and things like that. Uh, the the other point was also to have to reduce you know the, the supply the length of the supply chain because you have a lot of intermediaries we call here Easter. So we, we wanted to have this direct connection with the producer so that they can also get more money from the the copra. Uh, um, I mean, the, 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 the production of the copra. Uh, we wanted also to uh, improve the quality of the copra, so we asked Profetri and the, the Ashma. Ashma is the Uilori Modern de Dijon, which is producing the copra oil. So we asked them to, 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 to 
build some semi semi modern dryers. So here on the picture, you can see the semi modern dryers where women were working as well. So it is help us to improve improve the quality of the copra. But not only that, we could also use the, the uh, semi modern dryers to uh, teach to train the farmers, show them how uh, you can properly dry the copra. Next slide. And after having done all that, we could see that you know the organization of the, the, the producers, of the, the, the transport, uh, all that, the traceability issues, we could, we could really see the increase of the production of the copra coming from the small borders. And, and, and yeah, it's uh, the consequence was, of course, for, for Ashma, the really modern Abidjan, to increase the capacity of the mill uh, in Abidjan. Uh, I would say here at, at this level, I would say it was easier for us to set up all that because we have Profetrade as uh, his sustainability manager is on the ground. He's here at, in Ivory Coast, a German, he will speak uh, just after me, but he's living here in Ivory Coast and all the action that we set up, it, it was really pushing Ashma, it was pushing also with us, the small holders to, to really implement the action it is, and it's helped us a lot. So Ralph, I will let you the floor so that you can explain uh, what you have uh, set up so far. Thank you. Hi, yeah, good evening, everybody. My name is Ralph Erdmann. Uh, I'm working for Pro Fairtrade. Please, next slide. So, uh, yeah, as uh, Jérôme uh, explained, we tried to make a lot of improvement in Ivory Coast. And in 2012, we founded a company called PMCI. And this company, uh, the idea of the company, the main reasons of the company is to secure the sustainable co Cobra supply in the future and fix uh, all the key challenges, uh, which uh, Jérôme uh, mentioned it, uh, before. Um, we had uh, two goals. For this company first goal was uh, to set up uh, new plantations industrial plantations and at the other hand uh, to work hand in hand very strong with a smallholder and initiate new programs development programs and uh, renewable programs for the farms as um, Jerome indicated as farms this uh, coconut plantations they was planted uh, 1960 1970 so they are very old and since uh, the last uh, years, we got a lot of new requirements of quality and traceability. Um, this company will help us to um, set up uh, industrial copra production next year to avoid uh, the PAH Mosh and MOA levels. Uh, next slide, please. So um, to work with all these farmers, we created our own uh, farming man management system called iDiscover together with a company called Defo Impact. And um, our farm stuff is, uh, um, uh, this is a mobile application, it's working with a mobile application. So every farm staff member have a mobile phone with a GPS device. And um, he record all the data which we need to make sure that the supply chain is safe and um, to work very close with the farmers. Next slide, please. First advantage, for example, of this activity, every farmer now, he have his own mapping, he have his map automatically when uh, the farm staff, the farm uh, staff has um, made the mapping, um, the application gets synchron synchronized with the um, database and uh, we can print out uh, um, <clears throat> uh, 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 the map for each and every farmer which is very important today because the, the farmer, normally they don't know how many hectares they have, how many land they have, and uh, uh, it, gives them, it gives them a lot of opportunities for, for future work with us. Next slide, please. So we uh, cut it down a lot uh, of the middlemen. We uh, have direct um, contact uh, with the farmer. Um, now we're getting a global gap and grass certified for all our uh, supply chain members, all our farmers. And we are working on uh, organic and particial also on fair trade uh, certifications at the moment. Generally, we pay around 10% uh, premium to all our farmers in the supply chain. And we um, 
uh, try to to give them a lot of uh, help to improve the the work in the farms and um, also we uh, set it up some um, renewal plantation programs for the future with the local partner Sendra. Sendra is the um, supplier of the uh, of the coconut uh, seeds or plants and, and ivory coast. And we set it up uh, some warehouses uh, to collect and uh, select uh, the different uh, nut qualities. Next slide, please. So based on our um, uh, uh, our uh, uh, traceability software, we can trace uh, all our loadings. In this, in this case, uh, crude coconut oil from the farm, from uh, each and every farmer to the destination. Next slide, please. Um, as I as I as I told at the beginning, we uh, one of our goal was to set up a new industrial plantation, which is the first one after I think maybe 50 years or 40 years in Ivory Coast. We secured uh, 894 hectares land. Um, together with um, Earthworm Foundation, we made an FPIC process and uh, have now a land title for PMCI. We are owner of this land and we start planted and we have already 200 hectares planted. And um, the idea is to intercrop this, um, um, this new industrial plantation with cocoa. Next slide. Yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you very much, Jerome and Ralph, for giving us uh, insights about uh, the, the reality uh, of what's going on in Ivory Coast and also the project uh, over there. It's uh, also uh, very um, enriching. So now um, we are done with the presentation. I, I suggest to move to our Q&A session. So I see that we have a, a question for Leonie. Um, so Leonie, actually, um, we were wondering um, in what way uh, the brands and also the, the producers can collaborate together to find solutions to the industry uh, challenges. Um, and what about the collective actions? Thanks a lot, Mathilde. Yes, actually for us, that was one of the, the questions as well before we started with this project. And I think that's um, probably a main question for, for, for other brands as well, because compared to other oils like palm oil, I would say sustainability in coconut oil is less um, advanced and there is no um, big volumes available of certified um, coconut oils, for example. I know that there is a, an initiative going on right now, which is called Sustainable Coconut Charter. Um, that's an initiative that was launched by USAID and Barry Colabo, where they try to bring the industry together to, to work on one common um, kind of framework for coconut sustainability programs. However, they're just kicking that off. I think there's a webinar taking place in two weeks about it. Um, and we'll see uh, where exactly that goes. And apart from that, I'm not really familiar with other big initiatives in, in that area. Okay. Thank you very much, Leonie. I'd um, like to ask a question to Julia um, to, to see if um, how do you see the plan to, to scale up uh, the, the pilot project and uh, how do, do you see it and, and what would be the main uh, roadblock for scaling up? Uh, thank you, Mathilde. So uh, as I mentioned on my presentations, actually we are starting to develop a network of lead farmers. So we are actually selecting uh, some of the farmers that we have, you know, we have trained um, so far uh, we, we pick the good ones and then we, we, we basically, uh, you know, encourage them to become the leads in their communities and basically to be able to continue the work that we have and, and to also, you know, uh, scale up or, or expanding the, the knowledge and also the solutions that we have um, in, the, in the regions where, where they're uh, located. The second uh, point that we are also you know, trying to um, to uh, to scale this uh, program is through a collaboration with the stakeholders. 
Uh, however, uh, what we have, you know, um, uh, experience so far, the stakeholders, uh, you know, the challenges is that we have to find a way and find a common goals, you know, um, between the different stakeholders, which sometimes we, we don't really meet the, the common ground. Uh, so, for example, like uh, last year, um, you know, we, we've been in communicating with, uh, with uh, one of the key stakeholders in Solomon Islands. Uh, you know, trying to work on a certain topics, uh, but then uh, since these uh, stakeholders is, you know, no longer active or uh, these stakeholders also, uh, you know, focusing in other provinces, um, you know, because the, uh, this, the, the country is, is, is consists of many islands, um, so that we are actually haven't really met the, you know, um, the targeted areas. Um, so understanding the stakeholders uh, where they are focusing on uh, what kind of value proposition that that can uh, you know add uh, you know um, can be an additional to what we have done uh, that's a really key or important um, things that we have to we have to identify thank you thank you Yulia um, I see another question for Leonie are you finding that consumers are asking for more information about the sustainability of coconuts and how are you addressing this? A good question. Actually, no, we don't um, see any questions around coconut oil yet. I think in the consumers' minds, palm oil is still kind of the bad guy and um, there were not many reports about sustainability issues around coconut oil so far. I think that's uh, one re uh, reason, but as Matilda, you explained at the beginning, volume demand for uh, coconut oil is increasing. And I think this will sooner or later also increase the risk of deforestation and then put more and more media attention also to coconut oil sustainability issues. Um, the second reason why uh, we don't have many requests is um, because I believe uh, it's not a, a big ingredient in chocolate, as mentioned in the beginning. It's used in some fillings, um, but uh, not on a super large scale. And it's not the first uh, raw material that comes uh, into mind um, when thinking about chocolate, as we don't use it in, in the tablets, for example. Thank you, Leonie. Uh, we have now uh, questions for all. Do you see the need for satellite monitoring for sustainable sourcing and transparent supply chain? Uh, perhaps, Jérôme, you can give a try at this one. I'm sorry, Mathilde, I was answering to a question online. <laughs> OK, no problem. So the question is, do you see the need for satellite monitoring for sustainable sourcing and transparent supply chain? Um, actually, I think in, in all the commodities uh, today, it is something that is being set up. And, and I think it could also be set up in the in coconut business. Why not? In Ivory Coast, we, we are setting up that in cocoa, in cocoa uh, sector. Uh, we are setting that uh, up in, in, in other sector in, in Liberia and, and uh, yeah, the, the, the only issue I see here regarding Ivory Coast, for instance, is that the cocoa, the cocoa uh, palm trees plantation are on the coast in Ivory Coast and on the coast, uh, it is really only sandy, uh, you don't have any tree there. Uh, you could have some, some protect area like mangrove and things like that, uh, just to be sure that the mangroves are not, are not destroyed. Uh, for, only for that, yeah, there is a possibility to set up, to set up uh, satellite imagery, but, but I don't see a, a, a huge, huge challenge of deforestation actually regarding the coconut business here in Ivory Coast. Uh, in other countries, you may have inland cocoa, cocoa uh, palm plantations, and could be it could be uh, yeah a nice tool to set up. Thank you, Jean. I see that we have another question for Leonie. In other countries in Asia, for example, in the Philippines, we have seen a loss of native tree coverage and biodiversity. 
as primitive forests have been cut to plant coconut trees. Is that also an aspect which Lind and Sprungli is trying to look into, maybe via the community training that you mentioned? Um, yes, uh, I, I think I will hand over the question later on to Julia as well, but uh, as part of the first initial assessment that we did, we also did the satellite assessment, or actually Eurofom is doing that, um, where we found out where we have uh, coconut oil plantations and since when, and we see that these are more or less stable so that we don't have um, um, a lot of deforestation going on to expand these coconut um, plantations. I think that's maybe rather specific now to the Solomon Islands because it's um, so much driven by smallholder uh, farming and less large scale plantations. However, of course, yes, it's also part of trainings and sensitizations of farmers. Um, we see, for example, an issue um, that um, a lot of mangroves are destroyed uh, around the coast, uh, not to kind of replace it with coconut oil, but um, to do fire and as mentioned before fire is also used for coco co coconut drying so for the copra production and of course farmers are sensitized on the issue um, and the importance that mangroves have to save their islands. Julia I'm not sure if you want to add something on that. Yeah uh, just to add what Lenny have mentioned uh, so we have been uh, trying to monitor uh, a deforestation in in the project locations uh, that we work uh, in Solomon Islands, and we have seen that many of the uh, you know deforestations are mainly happening uh, in the inland. Means that uh, it's pretty uh, quite deep into um, the you know uh, the area where actually coconut is not really produced. Um, and we've seen from our satellite monitoring that it's, um, it's, it's mainly because of a logging uh, concessions uh, or logging activities. Um, and there is concessions or uh, concessions that, we, that also work with the, with the communities there. Um, so, and, and we actually trying to, um, you know, um, uh, this year started to uh, you know, uh, encouraging our farmers to uh, do some kind of rehabilitations uh, of some uh, deforested or degraded areas as well. Thank you. Uh, now we have a question for Ralf. Um, what further lessons can other countries uh, learn about uh, replicating the ivory and copra quality? I didn't understand by what, sorry, excuse me. Um, what further lessons can other countries learn about uh, replicating the ivory and copra quality? Uh, I don't know, I'm, <laughs> we, we just, uh, I don't know the, the, the speci specialities of uh, other countries. Uh, I mean, we are fixed on Ivory Coast, we are, we are working in Ivory Coast and uh, I don't know what to answer. Huh? <laughs> okay. J Jérôme, perhaps you want to complement? Maybe, maybe, maybe Jérôme, you can tell something about. I, th I think one of the key things in and that the first the first president of Ivory Coast and first president, um, yeah, Ufri Boy in, in the sixties, um, yeah, was you know to set up a, a research center, a really uh, good agricultural research center. I mean, on palm oil or palm business, so, so coconut palm, uh, cocoa, cocoa palm and palm, palm oil. And it is something that's helped a lot because even Malaysia at that time came here to take some, you know, some, some cook, uh, palm trees uh, to, to, to um, Kuala Lumpur and things like that. So in the past, it was really a research center. I mean, it's, still exist today and you could see also in, on the slide i show you on the regarding the productivity uh, the, the the challenge we have today is that you know uh, this research center does not have this funding anymore because the agriculture business i mean uh, beside coconut uh, uh, beside cocoa sector uh, the other agriculture uh, commo agricultural commodities are a little bit let down that is, that is a pity, but I think the research 
uh, at that time was really, really very, very good. And, and the impact of that for me could be this quality of the, of the copra and of, of the coconut uh, oil. Uh, beside that, it is also depend on the organization of the sector. When, when the, the president developed this, this uh, co coconut sector, you have two big industrial plantation and around the industrial plantation, you have the smallholder plantation. And the smallholder plantation were actually uh, managed as industrial plantation because, uh, because it was public and eh? public industrial plantation. So the managers was dealing in the industrial plantation the same way like in the, in the smallholder plantation. So all the quality of the copra is also linked to that, I think. And um, unfortunately, yeah, we need to, to, to keep doing that. It is what profit trade is actually doing in the, the coconut sector in Ivory Coast today. They are opening their own plantation, but at the same time, they are also coaching really uh, the smallholder uh, farmers so that we can, we can really come back to, to, to this quality of the cocoa, coconut uh, oil. And, and we can see that because I've seen some, some of the, 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 the analysis, the, the, the data, uh, and I think they are still really good. Thank you, Jérôme. Now comes the time of the end of our Q&A session. I would like to thank uh, uh, our four speakers and also all the participants who were able to join us today. Um, so shortly after this call, you will receive the, the recording of this session. Um, we will share also with you a survey to get your feedbacks uh, to, to understand how we can improve further the webinars and also to get ideas from you on which topic you would like to address in the, in the future webinars. Um, given that, um, yes, thank you to, to all of you and um, let's uh, keep safe. <laughs> and uh, see you later then.